Okay. Gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is a powerful program that we have in store, and I'm not going to say too much because we know uh, we have some of your classmates to really introduce. And I've uh, been fortunate enough uh, to hear uh, Mr. Wright speak uh, on several different occasions, and it is a moving program, and it is a message that we need to deliver to you, um, not only as students here, but as human beings. You need to hear this presentation today. Uh, and it's not an easy one to hear. Obviously, it gets delivered by a, a master here. Uh, and I think you're going to take more away um, a very powerful and important message. Um, you'll understand you'll you'll what that is at the end of the program. The show. But it is something you need to reflect and, uh, on. This is something you go home today and you talk to the master. And they say, well, what, 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 what are you doing in school today? It's this is something that you share. What we brought to you today. And he does this because he wants you to hear the message. He does this out of the kindness of his heart. Um, but it is something, again, it's hard for me not to talk more about it, but I'm going to be classmates in the So I want to have um, Nicolina and Kenneth who are going to come and speak a little bit about the our um, presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Good morning. We would like to welcome Mr. Wright for being here with us today. We are very fortunate to have a first-hand account from a survivor of the Holocaust here with us. He has been to the Port Jefferson School year and year again with us sharing his story, and every year we appreciate it even more than the last. He has devoted the later parts of his life to educating today's youth of the accounts of the Holocaust, and we can't say thank you. No one knows exactly how many innocent men, women, or children were sent to the auschwitz birkenau concentration camp. Historians estimate that about 1.3 million were sent. We do know, however, that about 1.1 million died in these camps. This is about 85% of the people that were sent to these camps. Many of the deaths were still drawn out by Nazi The German state and remaining SS soldiers and officers even attempted to cover up such a horrible crime. Thanks to one Hungarian lawyer, however, who exposed the truth about them during the Nuremberg trials, However, 74 years later, it is of the utmost importance that we educate to inform each other so that history doesn't repeat itself and so that nothing similar can happen in the future. For today's presentation, I'd like to call Peyton Broyles, who will introduce some poetry readings as a way to pay tribute and say thank you to Mr. Wright for coming today. One day, Ms. Everett introduces a poem to my English class where we have to pick a topic or issue that's currently happening in the world. So we have to write a poem based on Martin Miller's format that was introduced. I'm sure some of my class thought it was just a pleasure to keep us busy or just to remind me I, in particular, saw the connection of our, pro of our, of our poem assignment to the book we've been reading in class. The story of one man, Billy Wiesel's personal experience in the Holocaust. The genocide of six, over six million Jews in Europe, controlled by Nazi Jews. Hitler's vehicle was the country's problem, the death, the sadness, and the fear. The aim of our project was to pick an enduring issue and write a poem about what it entails. The anguish, the anger, the despair of people feel, or think, or the time it's talked about. The aim to transform the tone of the writing and inspire the writer to make a difference in the world. And to help each other for the better. And we can only wish that more people felt the guilt for the pain and responsibility of others. Help and save people like one or right. Save people and save lives instead of blame each other and not claim the responsibility of death. One said by Eli Marvel himself in his speech, The Pals of Indifference. And together we walk towards in a millennium carried by profound fear and extraordinary hope. Our first reader is Ruby Ray reading her work Step Aside. Our second reader today is Sophie Blumenthal reading Women Can Change the World. And to close our poetry today, we can learn in ignorant skills. Step Aside. Step Aside. You did not earn a public, not earn a public voice, elders say. I go ignored. Your thoughts are youthful, Your thoughts are youthful elders I say. I go unnoticed. Your voice, Your voice is young, elders say. I am an Eden. You act with energy, you act with energy elders I say. I am disdain. You dream, you dream elders I say. I am ridiculed. You have, a vision. you have a vision, elders say. I am scorned. You are the young, you are the young 
about to say. Heed the old. Don't heed yourselves. Don't heed yourselves. You can learn if you follow, I'll just say. Except Trump, Hillary, Bernie, Biden, Schumer, and Pelosi. At 70 plus, they are a must. We burn to be heard, say the young. Do not give the aged our trust. We have overcome, say we the young. Talab, Beto, Ocasio-Cortez are our dawn's horizon. We will be heard, say we the young. You elders, step aside. First they said we were unequal to them, but we were just as strong. They said we were to be seen and not heard, but we had a voice. They said we couldn't work, but we did it just as well as the men. They said we had to wear skirts, but we wore pants anyway. They said we couldn't vote, but now we are doctors, lawyers, and even political leaders. They said only they could play sports, now we run marathons. They said we would never do anything special, but now we are some of the most powerful leaders in the country. They said we wouldn't make it, now we make a difference. Ignorance is everywhere, and it's inevitable. It's in the streets, schools, and our homes. Ignorance is chaos, causes riots, crime, war, and death. Ignorance is killed and killed again. Ignorance ruins right. Ignorance ruins right. lives, and including your own. Ignorance gives incomprehensible pain to everyone and yourself. Ignorance causes suicide and pain inside of yourself because you are kept inside the chain fence of ignorance. Ignorance causes depression and severe oppression that works through to only expose the tears of the colors of the Ignorance releases hellish fire with all possible desire. And you need to focus on the lives that you take, the people you break, the world that you make, the self mission you create, along with all the fights and the rights, followed by sleepless nights, all till daybreak. Ignorance is stealing the passion and the ration and all satisfaction. So pick a side, open your eyes, and realize that ignorance kills. Now have the honor of introducing survival of the Holocaust, Werner Wright. Thank you very much. Uh, could we possibly dim the lights a little bit? Thank you. Today I, will Today I will be talking to you about what happens when we don't take care of each other. On August 24th, 1941, in the middle of World War II, while Germany was bombing Great Britain, Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill addressed the people of Great Britain and he spoke to them on the BBC about the German invasion of Russia. And this is what he had to say. The aggressor, and by this he meant the German military, retaliates by the most frightful cruelties as his armies advance. Whole districts are being exterminated. Scores of thousands, literally, Scores of thousands of executions in cold blood are being perpetrated by the German police troops upon the Russian patriots who defend their native soil. Since the Mongol invasion of Europe in the 16th century, there has never been methodical, merciless butchery of such a scale or approaching such a scale. And this is but the beginning. Famine and pestilence are yet to follow in the bloody ruts of Hitler's text, where the pre presence of a crime without a name. It took many, many years until a name could be found. And the name is the Holocaust. And I'm here to speak about it today. But before we speak about the Holocaust, uh, few questions which we have to answer. The first, one the first one obviously is what do the words Holocaust and Shoah mean? And both words can be used completely interchangeably. Holocaust comes from the Greek translation of a word from the Hebrew Bible and consists of really two words, holos which means all and kostos 
which means to burn. It means a whole burnt offering, an offering that doesn't serve God or man any good. And in other words, it's a useless killing. And Shore is Hebrew. It simply means disaster or tragedy. So, whichever so, word you know how to spell or how to pronounce, oh, you can, turn you the can do it. It's exactly the same. <coughs> the next question is, what was the Holocaust? No, the Holocaust was the Nazi destruction of selected groups and their culture. The Nazis didn't just randomly kill people, but they wrote their houses of worship of their art and then set them on fire. Do we really have any proof that the Holocaust happened? Sure. We have mass graves, we have witnesses like myself, we have US documentation. Every time a concentration camp was liberated by American forces, pictures were taken, people were interviewed, artifacts were taken, movies were taken. We have photographs taken by the Holocaust. Actually, I showed you already one. And we have trials of the Holocaust. And despite all of these proofs, there are still people who walk around and who say that the Holocaust never existed. Who are these Holocaust deniers? Holocaust deniers are people who made all who are not exactly like that. They think this is a proper way to treat Jewish men. This is a proper way to treat gay people. And this is a proper way to treat people of color. Holocaust deniers believe that they imagine supremacy as a master race justifies the murder of everybody else. Never ever, never ever debate a Holocaust denier. Never do that, please. Because truth does not be the defense. It's as simple as that. So the next question really is, what caused the Holocaust? In the late 1920s, there were huge economic problems throughout Europe and in the United States. There were the crashes of the stock market, there was unemployment, there was even devaluation of money in Europe. And in Germany, you had a leader who had a very simple solution. Create the super Germany and eliminate all imagined enemies. So, who would these enemies be? They were communists, political opponents, critics, writers, artists, and the inferior and the useless. Jews, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Gypsies, Black people, Communists and gay, were considered useless and inferior. And handicapped people were considered useless. And they were arrested and murdered. Of course, we would call this type of a behavior as intolerance. And what we are looking for, obviously, is the, exactly the opposite, tolerance. But do we really want tolerance? Tolerance means to put up with something. We don't want tolerance. What we want is acceptance. Accept people regardless of color, race, sexual orientation, age, origin, religion, or sex. There's nothing you can do about any of these things. You can't change your age, you can't change the color of your skin. And uh, bullying for any of these reasons is considered a hate crime. I want you to remember that. And the shortest penalty is 18 months of jail. Even if you're under 16. 
And nobody in the room by looking at these boxes would say for sure which of them contained gold and which contained garbage. Yet I'm quite sure that there are some of you here in this room who know exactly I was the first one to ask. by looking at people who is good and who is bad. Let me ask you this. Would you like to be judged for college admission based on your looks? Of course not. So, why judge other people? The next question was, is of course, was the Holocaust a battle of Christians against Jews? That's how it's very often being represented. We know that six million Jews died, but what is truly unfortunately forgotten is that roughly six million Christians and Muslims died too. Altogether roughly 12 million people were murdered. If I were to ask you to imagine 12 million people, you could. Number, numbers are much too large. We're not used to dealing with numbers of that size. So let's do this. Let's line up 12 million people. One person behind the other and allow one foot three inches for each person. That's roughly the length of your arm. And if you started that line in New York City, that line, would that line would stretch from New York Midwest. across the Midwest, the Rocky Mountains, all the way to California. That's 12 million people. Roughly six, Roughly six million, million died in various concentration camps and the, other six and the other six million in the killing fields of Ukraine and other countries. Whenever we, speak about Whenever we speak about the Holocaust, we say, hey, the Germans did this, the Germans did that, the Germans did the other. But really, but really were all the killings done by the Germans? Look at this list. Look at this list. Every single nation that Germany occupied provided collaborator killing Every single one of them, except one, Bulgaria. So, how was it possible that so much evil succeeded? It has been said that all that is necessary for evil to succeed is that good people do nothing. In 1933, when Hitler and his party came to power, and they were burning books by German, French, British, American authors, <coughs> the, good people did the good people did nothing. When they arrested people, they arrested people, people and put them into camps, the good people did nothing. The good people did nothing. When they, when they banned paintings by Van Gogh and Picasso, the good people did nothing. The good people did nothing. When they, when they killed 1900 Catholic priests, the good people did nothing. The good people did nothing. When they arrested people of color and put them into concentration camps, the good people did nothing. When they lined up gypsies and shot them, the good people did nothing. And these were probably the biggest enemies of Germany. Because as long as you have little children around, they will grow up and they too will have children. But if you manage to arrest all these little children and then murder them, there will be no, no more little children. And uh, 19, one and a half million little children were murdered. They eliminated entire towns as a revenge action. For instance, the town of Lidice was completely leveled completely. The cemeteries were dug up and all the men were shot. And the 81 children in the town were taken, put in the back of vans and exhaust fumes piped in. 
peace, peace, doctors and nurses, and they are doctors and nurses, participated in the murder of 270,000 people because according to the government, their life was unworthy of life. They were handicapped people, they were mentally retarded, epileptics, even babies with birth defects. And they injected these people with gasoline or put them into gas chambers. 270,000 of them. Here are just some of the people who were persecuted. Specific authors, Polish noblemen, communists, Jews, gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, gay people, even farmers who needed food. And the good people did nothing. So, what kind of the people were the Nazis, really? Nazis were cowards who wrote anonymous letters. They sent letters to the newspapers, they sent them to government offices, they sent them to places of employment, to schools. And many, many people committed suicide as a result of that. Today we call it cyberbullying. It's exactly the same thing. And many people who have been cyberbullied have committed suicide. Nazis painted on windows and walls, just like people still do right here on Long Island. They organized in gangs. They dressed the same way. They combed their hair the same way. They attacked individuals, just like these seven bullies here on Long Island, who in 2008 murdered Marcelo Lucero. The Nazis knew one thing for sure, that bystanders protect bullies. And so you have two Jewish students standing in front of a blackboard where they're being humiliated, where somebody had written on the blackboard, the Jews are our biggest enemy. Jews were forced to scrub sidewalks, to be on the ground. Some people enjoy watching other people on the ground. Sometimes they had to do it with, they had to scrub the sidewalk with toothbrushes. And uh, you would see it sometimes in schools where students knock down other people's books and the students have to pick them up off the floor. No difference. Nazis would look for ways to oppress others. So they had thousands of ways by individual groups who had to observe these laws. There were some 2,000 anti-Jewish laws. For instance, the public was forbidden to buy from Jews. So they had outside Jewish stores, they had big signs which said, Germans, defend yourself, don't shop from Jews. Jews were fired by all schools, colleges, and corporations. We can't imagine in this day and age somebody being fired because of their religion. We can't imagine it, we can't imagine it happening in this country. And it, wasn't too long and it wasn't too long ago when we had signs like these all over the United States. And we had signs like, and we had signs like these. And we had signs like, and we had signs like these. Jews got, a big Jews got a big J stamped on their identification card. And they got a new middle name. If you were a man, it was Israel. And if you were a woman, it was Sarah. And this is the way a Jewish passport looked like. Jews had to wear yellow star. And if you lived in Germany, this is the way it started. But if your name was Anne Frank, this is the way it both looked. Signs like, these. signs like these, caution, Jews in the village, and special pensions for Jews. Wasn't too long ago when we had special benches for black people in this country. We had special water fountains. 
And we had special, and we had special seats house. in the movie houses. Jews were, arrested Jews were arrested and put in camps in ghettos, and, and the good people did nothing. So, why did, so the, why did the Jews fight back? Because for every, because one, for every one Jew, there were 133 Germans. Not much of a fighting charge, is there? So, if there were so few Jews, how did the Germans develop this hate against the Jews? Well, the Nazis dehumanized the Jews. They showed the Jew as a worm. They showed them as a snake. Showed them as a caterpillar. And if you repeat the lie often enough, people will believe it. How about cartoons like this? Here the Jew is a spider. This cartoon is not from Germany. No. It's right here from the United States, from a newspaper called White Aryan Resistance. And if you wish, you can subscribe to it. It's printed out on the West Coast. And in it you find cartoons like this. Hate is very much alive in these United States. So obviously, Jews tried to escape from Germany. And uh, 32 nations got together to find out who's going to take some of these refugees. But the tone for the conference was set by the Canadian representative who said, let the Germans solve their Jewish problem. In other words, let the murderer solve his victim's problems. And as a result of that, only one single nation, the Dominican Republic, was the only nation that accepted some refugees. That's it. In other words, the good people did nothing. And when the Germans heard that the world didn't give a damn about the Jews, they had the night of the broken glass. In one night, untold numbers of homes were ransacked. 7,000 businesses were destroyed. 1,700 houses of worship were vandalized or burned down. And 30,000 people were arrested. All the insurance money was collected by the German government. And then the Jews were fined $400 million by the government. And the good people did nothing. There was only one country that opened its arms. And that was tiny Great Britain. They allowed children under the age of 17 to enter the country without parents, without any guardians whatsoever. And 9,800 children went to Great Britain. Anyone. Hardly any of them ever showed their parents again. And the few who did, maybe seven years later, eight years later, they didn't recognize the parents. And they couldn't even talk to them because the kids spoke English and the parents didn't. There was resistance in Germany. There was the White Rose Movement. Hans Schon and his sister Sophie Scholl and, and their friend Christoph <coughs> Probst. There were six flyers over a six months period. They were arrested in the morning, sentenced to death by lunchtime and beheaded by the afternoon. In January 1942, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, announced the final solution to the Jewish question. Ten million Jews, Ten million Jews were sentenced to death and six million were executed. But by this time, but by this time World War II was in full swing and nothing, nothing could be done. In 1933 my father was a mechanical and an electrical engineer. And we lived in Germany, and in 1933 he lost his job, and my sister and I, we couldn't go to school. 
So we left Germany and we went three countries away to Yugoslavia. And that's a picture of my sister and myself in 1933. I used to be adorable. I don't think I've changed too much. Uh, in, uh, we lived in a very beautiful town called Zagreb. But we immediately run into serious problems. We first, of we, first of all, my father couldn't find any work as an engineer because the country didn't need any engineers. And secondly, we had to learn Croat and we had to learn Serbian. And, uh, and uh, my parents never did. This point, At this point, I'm going to give all of you a little bit of homework. I know you're sitting here and cringing and wondering what is it going to be. Trust me, it's not going to be difficult. But it's going to be extremely important. Ask one of your foreign-born school friends how many languages do they speak? What did, their parents do what did their parents do for a living in their home country and how did they start in this country and what problems did your friends have? Don't write, don't write any reports, don't draw any graphs, don't do any of that stuff. Just sit down with them for five minutes or ten minutes. I want you to understand the, problem, the problems that refugees have. The world is full of refugees, and I, want you to have and I want you to have some compassion for them, some understanding. Then, not just a bunch of people who don't speak your language. There are people who have lost their home, their faith, and they need a lot, a lot of hugging. And it's up to you to do that. Just think about it. As I said, we lived in Zagreb, in a beautiful town, and that's a picture of me when I was about 11. And in the meantime, Germany kept occupying more and more countries around Yugoslavia, and there was no way we could escape. My father died when I was 12 years old, and a couple of months later, Germany invaded Yugoslavia. And there was a brief war of about a week long. And then Yugoslavia lost, and the part where I lived came under the ruling of Dr. Ante Pavelic. And he immediately opened a concentration camp called Yasenovac, where about 200,000 people were murdered. Most of these people were murdered by either starvation or by having their throats cut. It's nice like this. In one town in, in, one town in Kragujevac, a couple of German soldiers got shot. They so they went to a local school just like yours. They picked up 200 boys, just like you, and they marched them out of town. And then they shot them. And if not one of them, by the way, was Jewish. If you were a Jew, you had to wear a yellow star. And you had to wear the, yellow, to wear the yellow star in the front and also, and also on the back. And if, you and if you walked on the street and you wore a yellow star and there was a soldier, there was a soldier on the sidewalk, you had to step into the gutter. You couldn't be on the same sidewalk. My mother was afraid, My mother was afraid that something's going to happen to me, so she placed my sister with one family and placed me with a couple who worked for the resistance and I was 13 at that time. And so for the next two years, I was with the couple developing films and making enlargements for the resistance movement. I couldn't go near the windows because people from the street would see me. I couldn't wear shoes because people would hear me. And I lived like that for two years. I couldn't even call my friends. I didn't see my mother, and my father was dead. One day there was a knock at the door, 
and half a dozen German secret policemen came in. I was 15 at that time. And they took me down to their headquarters and they beat the living daylights out of me. They really beat me up. And then, and then I was locked up in a cell for three days and moved to, after three days, to a prison in Slovenia. And there I was locked up in a cell that was filled with fleas, thousands of them. And my arms and legs got swollen. I was wearing short sleeve shirt and uh, short pants. And from there I was shifted to Graz, Austria, and I found myself in this building, which still today is a police station in Graz. I was up on the third floor in the back of the building, locked up in a tiny little cell with three other kids. Two had been arrested for burglary, and the third kid had murdered his mother. And I was the fourth criminal there. And one, day I and one day I looked out of the window into the police station yard. And I saw my mother, and I saw my mother walking around with some other women. With some other women. And, that's the last and that's the last time I ever saw my mother. From there I was, From there I was shifted to Graz, Austria, and to Vienna. And I spent the night in this absolutely gorgeous synagogue. Except by the time, Except by the time I came there, it well, didn't look like this anymore. Looked like this. It was, destroyed. It was destroyed during the night of the broken glass. It was, uh, it was uh, dirty. dirty. There was soot and water, glass on the floor, torn prayer books. And I spent the night. And I spent the night there with a. 120 other people. And then the next, and then the next day, we were, we were put on a train and sent on a two-day two trip to Czechoslovakia. There I found myself in this building, in this place. Look at the thickness of the wall. The place was called Terrazin. Look at the height. And look at the funny shape. What it was, it was, what it was, it was a 150 year old fortress and when planes and were invented fortresses became silly because all you do is you fly over them and drop a couple of bombs so, so the military moved, out, military moved out civilians moved in and when the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia they said hey this is a great place for a concentration camp because if the enemy can't come in, the people inside can't go out either. And so they converted it into a concentration camp. They threw the civilians who lived there out and replaced them with prisoners. What is a concentration camp? If you have a whole bunch of people living very happily together, and one group thinks that they are better than the others, they can take all the other people and they can concentrate them in one little area. And once they're concentrated, then there are lots of things you can do with them. You can uh, do nothing with them, you can put them to work, you can work them to death, you can cut their throats, you can send them into gas chambers. And the Nazis did all of these things. There were thousands of these camps throughout Germany. Now some people think that, hey, the SS invented concentration camps. But that's not true. They had concentration camps 30 years before in Africa, in what's now known as Namibia. There they, locked up there they locked up the Hereros and the Nami, and they, and they starved them to death. This is the way, this is the, way the camp looked. It was, it was old, and old and dilapidated. No high officials, no high officials ever came there. The highest was Himmler, who was the head of the SS. This is where we slept. This is where we slept. And, 
and this is where we washed ourselves, and uh, this is how we arrived. Actually, we didn't arrive like this until I came. I helped lay these railroad tracks. I also worked outside the walls in mud where I cut willow branches and made baskets out of them. I I exterminated vermin from the buildings by taping up the inside of the windows and I used poison gas then to exterminate the vermin. Came back the next day and swept out any dead rats. I was there for 10 months without any contact anybody else outside. After 10 months they brought in a whole bunch of cattle cars just like this. They loaded us up about 2,000 of us, 100 per car, and then they put in a bucket, and that was it, finished. There were no seats or anything in there. They locked the doors, and off we went on a three-day train ride east. And when we got out of the railroad cars, we were faced immediately by a group of SS men, and prisoners. And if you look at the picture carefully, you will see that every one of them has a walking stick. And they were hitting us with these sticks over the head, over the shoulder, in the face, wherever they could. It didn't make any difference whether you were young, old, or whatever else. They were just beating us up and people were lying on the ground on the mud, screaming, crying, and nobody cared. The SS, they all wore SS caps, but they wore special uniforms, not the arrows on the lapel, but they had a skull and crossbow. These were SS men who had been assigned to work in concentration camps. Many of them were volunteers. Behind us was a gate, underneath us was mud, and next to us were electrically charged barbed wires. So we asked, where are we? And then they told us, we are in Auschwitz too, or Birkenau, which was an extermination camp. We've never heard of Auschwitz, never heard of Birkenau, didn't know what they were talking about, never even heard of an extermination camp. Actually, there were three camps there. There was Auschwitz I, which was a camp strictly for German criminals. They brought rapists, murderers, thieves, uh, child molesters, people who spent already 10, 20 years in jails. They brought them there to act as guards. There was Auschwitz III, which was a small factory, and then there was Auschwitz too, where we were. And the people from Auschwitz were these murderers and thieves. They were the ones who supervised us. This is the way Auschwitz too looked like. Everybody arrived at the green spot at the bottom. And then about 70% of the people were walked over to the red spots. That's where the gas chambers were and that's where their bodies were burned. All the clothes that they wore and anything that they brought with them was put in the area with the black spot over on the right hand side. The area above the green spot were six small camps and uh, they each served a different purpose while I was there. One was for Jehovah's Witnesses and one was for Gypsies. And while I was there, both camps were sent to the gas chambers or all the people in the camps. The area below the green spot was the women's camp. That's where Anne Frank was. And over on the right hand side, where the blue spot is, that's where the SS had their barracks. And although the Allied troops knew what was going on, not one bomb ever fell on the gas chambers 
on the railroad tracks or on the German barracks. In other words, the good, In other words, the good people did not. This is the way we look. This is the way we look. <coughs> And this, is the way the and this is the way the wind looked. And we all, and we all got the tattoo on our arms. And we also got, and the, we triangle also got the triangle on our uniforms. And depending, why and depending why you were in the camp, that's how the triangle was colored. Points and political prisoners were red, gay people pink, Joe were witnesses purple, gypsies black, Jews yellow, and thieves and murderers where light and dark green and these were the carpos or camp police and they had armbands labeling them as capo here you see a woman capo beating an old woman and look at a wooden stick she has in her hand this is a typical arrival picture people got into the camp and then they were split into two groups. Anybody under 12, pregnant women, handicapped people, people who were over 30, uh, over 40, they were all immediately sent to the gas chambers and killed. <coughs> this is a typical barrack in which we stayed. There were six people on each level. And sometimes, the and sometimes the top level turned on the bottom level and the bottom and, the, on, the next and the, on the next level, on the middle level and the middle on the bottom level and killed people on the bottom level. This is a woman's barrack, is a woman's barrack after liberation. There were, only there were only three people on each level before there were six. Before there were six. The other three had left on a death march. This is a game. Man's barrack after liberation. There are no pictures available of any of the barracks during before liberation. The man in the middle. The man in the middle has the only tooth property that we had: a bowl and a spoon. We didn't have watches. We didn't have rings. We didn't have glasses. We didn't have coats. Didn't have pencils. We had nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. The bowl was filled in the morning with some brown water made out of acorns and we got a piece of bread made out of flour and sawdust. For lunch we got a soup which was really salt water into which little pieces of dirty unwashed potatoes had been cut. There was sand and grit in that water. In the evening we got exactly the same soup and another piece of bread. Altogether we got roughly 400 calories a day, which is about the same as two slices of bread and butter. Eating that food gave us, number one, no vitamins, and as a result of that, people lost their teeth. And we also got diarrhea, terrible diarrhea. This and, that's and that's the toilet which we had to use. There was no toilet, there was no toilet paper there. This is a, this is a bench, they used, bench for they used for punishing us. You put, your you put your feet in the two holes in the bottom and then you leaned over the bench like this as this demonstration for General Eisenhower shows. And the one of the criminals held your arms, and the other criminal beat you with a stick, a walking stick. I've seen plenty of people dying on these benches. I once got 15 strokes on my back, and I didn't think I'm going to make it. There was constantly mud all over, and we had to stand in that mud three times a day and be counted. And if one person out of 6,000 was missing, we had to stand there and do push-ups, knee bends, and uh, do even leapfrog jumping. And you did these exercises until a few people were dead. There was no way you could escape from the camp. 
There was electrically charged barbed wire. There were guard towers. There were German shepherds that had been trained to run after prisoners and tear them apart. And if somebody managed to escape, they were caught within a couple of hours and brought back with a big cardboard sign around their necks. You said, cheer, cheer, I'm back here. And if they were lucky, and if they were lucky, if they were lucky, if they were lucky they were hanged. And if they were not lucky, the Nazis found some punishment for them. One man tried to escape, and they took a barrel and they hammered nails from the outside of the barrel into the barrel. They put the man in the barrel and they rolled it down a hill. I once had to watch how two men were beaten to pulp because they tried to escape. Many people committed, Many people committed suicide. Every day the and every day the power was turned off for half an hour or so, and the bodies were removed, and then the whole thing started again. This is one of the, this is one of the four crematoria that were there. And this is a gas chamber into which people were jammed with their arms raised high, then being naked and little children were thrown on top of them. And then the doors were closed and through this hole in the ceiling, these gas pellets were dropped. And when the people were dead, then the air was refreshed and the prisoners, special prisoners went into these gas chambers and dragged out the bodies. And they cut off the fingers to remove any remaining rings. They removed any gold teeth. And then they shoved the bodies into these ovens or burnt them out in pits. And the only thing that remained of the people were boxes full of wedding rings, piles of glasses, shoes, clothing, and uh, empty suitcases. I'm sometimes, asked, I'm sometimes asked, what's the worst thing that really happened to you? I would say the worst, I would say the worst thing was I was 16 years old and didn't, know and didn't know from one day to the next whether I'm going to be alive. The air was constantly, the air was constantly filled with the smell of burning air and burning flesh. And we heard the screaming of the people who were driven to the gas chambers. One day Dr. Mengele came into the camp. He was also affectionately known as the angel of death. And Dr. Mengele and a group of his asthmen stood together were telling jokes. And all the young people in the camp, all the young boys had to strip. And we had to run past Dr. Mengele. And we were running for our lives. We tried to look taller and stronger and healthy and happy and anything we could. And occasionally Dr. Mengele stood there and he nodded his head and somebody went to the side. When it was finished with it, there were maybe 300 of us on one side. We had to run again and then there were 200 and eventually there were 89. And the 89 of us, we were sent to an adjacent camp, and over the next five days, the remaining 5,000 prisoners in the camp were sent to the gas chambers and killed. I was sent to Auschwitz I, where the criminals were, and I worked in the stables. And in January 1945, <coughs> I in, the middle, I, in the middle of the coldest winter in the 20th century, we were given a piece of, we bread, given a piece of bread and we started on a death march. We walked, we walked for a couple of hours and then we stopped and the people who couldn't get up were shot or they just froze to death on the road. And we, first night we slept in some stables and then we continued. And the second day, people were stripping themselves naked because they couldn't carry 
the uniform, the clothing, and it was much too heavy, and uh, there were bodies all over. By the third day, we arrived at the railroad siding. We had walked 35 miles, and uh, of the 60,000 60, who started, 15,000 were dead. And then we were loaded into open railroad cars, and we traveled in these open railroad cars under the supervision of young kids with guns. At one railroad station, there was next on the next track there was a steam engine, and there was a man standing next to the steam engine. So I handed him my ball. And I asked him to give me some of that condensed water that came out of one of the pistons. And he gave it to me. And uh, it was, without a doubt, the best food I ever had in my entire life. And I've been eating in pretty good restaurants. But nothing can beat a bowl of dirty warm water after being out in the fresh air for four days. We continued, we continued traveling for four days and we ended up in a place called Mauthausen. Mauthausen was a, in Austria, was a concentration camp from hell. They had a set of steps, 186 steps, and prisoners were forced to carry rocks up these steps and then drop them into the valley. Prisoners were forced to walk up these steps and push each other off the cliff into the valley. Prisoners were stripped naked in the winter and sprayed with water. We who were still alive managed to get through this gate and through this mud and eventually they're taken into one of the barracks and they're showered. And we collapsed, and we collapsed screaming with pain. It was, the most it was the most painful experience I've ever had in my entire life. Because all of us were, because all of us were frostbitten. And many, people died and many people died on the spot. After three days, After three days my feet started to rot. And there was a... And there was a Serbian dog, and he cut off my toes on one foot and part on the other foot, and that's how he saved my life. And then, and then things got really bad because we were squeezed between Russian and American forces, and there was no food there. There were thousands upon thousands of bodies all over. We ended up getting a tablespoon of moldy bread a day. I slept, next I slept next to a dead man for three days just to get his ration. And on the 5th of May, we were liberated by American forces. And this is the way we looked. And those of us who were still alive looked like this. I was at that time 17 years old, and I weighed 64 pounds. And then the American forces gave us the only food they had, military rations. <coughs> and, we ate these and we ate these, and about 20,000 people died. I had the can of chewing tobacco, I didn't know what I was eating. They brought in the local, they brought in the local population, they picked up the bodies, and they buried them in mass graves. And after three weeks, I got a slip of paper and I was told to go home. And I hitched my train back from Austria to Yugoslavia. And when I came back to Yugoslavia, there was communism there. And I lived under communism for two years. It was just as bad as the Nazis. Nothing. No difference, only they were running after different people. After two years, after two years I managed to escape to England. 
When I came to England, when I came to England, I had no schooling. I had no, I had no skills, and I had couldn't speak English. So I started working. So I started working as a laborer, then I became a machine tool fitter, and I took a dye maker. I got married, and I came to the United States, and I. Went to college for 10 years at night. I worked as an industrial engineer and consultant. To me, to me a swastika always means horror, in one form or another. To you, it should mean two different things. Number one, that everybody here in this room is a target for people who promote swastikas. You're a target because of your religion, because of your ancestors, because of the books that you read, because of sometimes even the name or even your looks, the color of your skin. And secondly, to paint a swastika is a very, very serious crime in New York State, paint or scratch as well as the If you are caught, you get a criminal record. Three out of four people with criminal records are unemployed, number one. Number two, no school will accept you, and no job will be open for you. You won't be able to get a bank loan either for college education. In any oppression, whatever it may be, there are always four groups of people. There are the victims, the bully, the just, and the bystanders. The victims, they can be divided very simply into the dead, who are commemorated by tombstones, monuments, or little plaques on the sidewalk in some countries. And the survivors, who most of them ended up in displaced person camps and then dispersed throughout the world. Hardly any of them ever went back home. The bully and his gang, Hitler, Goering and Goebbels committed suicide. There were a few hundred trials at the end of the war. There still are on and off from time to time trials. But uh, what happened to the vast majority of SS men? 9,000 of them had escaped to South America. Amongst them, Dr. Joseph Mengele, who accidentally drowned in Brazil on a beach in 1978. And then there were the just people. I like to prefer to call them the good people who did something. Their basic question was simply this, how do I save the lives of these people who were persecuted? So, meet peace, he, she was the woman who saved the Frank family, hid the Frank family. She tried and she managed to save them until they were arrested. And even then, one of them survived, Dr. Minster uh, Otto Frank. When she was asked, why did you do it? So she said, I did what any decent person would have done. And she risked her life. Monsignor Hugh Flatte. He was an Irish priest in Rome. He in the, actually worked in the Vatican. And he hid thousands of Jews in the Vatican and also in the Summer Palace. He also hid escaped prisoners of war. When he was asked why, he said it was the right thing to do. There was Dr. Ernst Leitz. He was the president of the Leica Corporation. He gave every one of his 300 Jewish employees a Leica so that they had some cash and found them jobs in America, Canada, 
Great Britain. When he was asked why, he said it was the right thing to do. Well, some of them who couldn't afford it even paid the fare. There was Senpo Sugihara. He was a Japanese diplomat and he stamped documents to transit Japan into China. He saved 6,000 people. He died in utter poverty. But he said it was the right thing to do. And then there's my favorite, Nicholas Wynn. He was a 29-year-old stockbroker, English stockbroker. He went to Czechoslovakia. He sold little children without parents. He said, I'll do something for them. So he forged documents. And, uh, and uh, he, created a he created a phony organization called the British Committee for Children in Prague. And he managed to save, managed to save 669 children. The reason, why he's my the reason why he's my favorite is because he had saved this little girl. This little girl, this little girl had been my girlfriend for four years. And then my wife for 61. She passed on, she passed on a couple of years ago. Here and here she is with Nicholas Wynn. I'm sorry, not Nicholas Wynn. Sir Nicholas Wynn. He got knighted by the Queen. And when he was asked, why did you do it? He said it was the right thing to do. So. How did you do the right thing and be a just person? You judge the situation, you understand the problem, you solve it, you take action. Don't wait for others, because other people are waiting for you, you're waiting for them, and then nothing happens. Be the first to act. And just people are just people. Not one of them came in on a white horse or shining arm. They're just people, just like you. Twelve million people, Twelve million people were murdered. Who's the murderer? Who's the murderer? Is, it the Is it the person who pulls the trigger? Or the good people, or the good people who don't stop it? What kind of a person, what kind of a person would you be when you know someone is in need? You can be one of the good people who does nothing. You can be like a friend of Annabel Cat. Annabel Cat had lots and lots of friends. And they knew that she was taking dope. They could have reported it and she could have been treated. But nobody said a word. She overdosed. She's dead. Audrey Pot. Little school student. Somebody took a picture of her in the nude and posted it on the internet. Friends could have stopped it, but they didn't. She got so embarrassed, she committed suicide, she's dead. And these kids, they were all bullied. Their friends could have stopped it, not one of them said a thing. They all committed suicide, they're all dead. So, when should you speak up? If you know someone, if you know someone is bullied or suffers for any reason, that's when you speak up. Speak to, your speak to your teachers and principals in the school. These people are professionals. They know how to handle a situation. Go to them. They are your friends. They are professional friends of yours. See the security staff if you wish, or the parents or guardian. But really, approach the teachers and principals. They know how to handle the situation. Now you know what happens when we don't take care of each other. I don't think anybody said it better than the late Dr. Martin Luther King. When he said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I really can't recall, I really can't recall what Hitler, Goering, or Goebbels said. But I, can still but I can still hear the sound of the door slamming into our faces when we ask to be saved. 
At the beginning of, At the beginning my, of my presentation, I answered many questions. I answered many questions. Now, now, by a show of hands, I'd like to ask you just one single question. How many of you will, How many of you will promise to help a friend without being asked? Beautiful. Beautiful. Please, please keep your promise. Don't be a silent friend. Thank you very much. I will. You will for. Ben? Uh, what's happening now? No, because I am. If and when we are ready, I'm willing to take some questions. So. Ben? Mr. Reich for being here and sharing his experiences and wisdom with us today, and thank you to Mrs. Everett for organizing this event. If anyone from the audience has any questions for Mr. Reich, now would be the time. What would happen to the family who is hiding someone like Jew? Anybody who, uh, anybody who was hiding anybody, uh, they were shot, they were killed. There was no, absolutely no mercy because they were working against the government. You know, the government said, we, it's like uh, you hiding an escaped murderer. Only the Nazis punished, you know, they tried to make it impossible for people to save others. You know, I'll be running after you, you know, and I can't find you, but he protects you, so if I catch on, uh, catch him protecting you, I will destroy it. And let me give you the best example, really, is uh, there were, there were several, towns, several towns like Santa Ana in Italy and uh, some other towns where the Nazis suspected, suspected please, that uh, uh, the resistance, that the members of the resistance lived in these towns, okay? They suspected that. So they, leveled these, so they leveled these towns completely. They killed everybody, they killed everybody in the town in Santa Ana. They took every inhabitant, they pushed them into the basements, and then they tossed hand grenades in. Okay, that's just to give you an idea. Okay. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Ah, we have a live one. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, my sister, the question is what happened to my sister. My sister, she stayed with another family. And then after a year, they said, look, thanks, but no thanks. It's getting too dangerous for us. Bye bye. So they tossed her out, and she escaped, and she escaped to Italy. Now escaping to Italy is like escaping from here to Newark, New Jersey. It's not that big a distance. And she was promptly arrested at the border of Italy and put in a detention camp. And the Italians didn't have concentration camp. They just they kept people there, and conditions were miserable because you had very little food. It was 
in the middle of World War II. But anyway, she stayed there for a year and then was liberated by British forces. She stayed on in Italy for another year, another maybe three, four years. And then she came to the United States and when I got married, I got united with her. She died in 1999. Any other questions? When was I, when did I realize what was happening? Uh, it took me, well, depending where, you know, for instance, I, you see, what, I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I have to, because I have to, I, I really have to introduce the whole idea. My parents were born in about 1880s, okay? They were what's known as Victorians or Edwardians. And they believed that children are to be seen and not heard. Which meant basically that there was a very limited relationship between my parents and myself. I didn't know why we left Germany. I didn't know the financial conditions of my parents. I didn't know uh, anything about the Nazi movement or anything like that. I was completely shielded. The first children should be shielded from bad news, which was about the worst idea you can have. If you have children, you have to prepare them to be adults. And as adults, we have to face Good and bad, and even as children. There are many children who lose a parent when they are six, seven years old. What are they going to do? Hide death from them, hide disasters. There are many children, you have a six, seven year old child where the father gets unemployed and where money is tied. And these things were spared. We children were spared of that, which was total nonsense and garbage because afterwards it kicked me in the head, you know, because I didn't know anything about the situation. I wasn't prepared for what was going to happen. I certainly was not prepared. The first time I realized I could be killed was when I was in Auschwitz. When I, and that took me three weeks. I didn't even realize when the Gestapo arrested me that they could have killed me right there. Which was stupid. Which was stupid because at one point I had the opportunity to escape and I didn't. I felt I was innocent, I didn't commit a crime, and therefore nothing will happen to me. That's the way I was brought up. Ethical behavior, you know? If you don't commit a crime, you don't have to feel guilt. And that's the way I grew up, which uh, was at that time totally unapplicable. So, I hope, I hope, did I answer your question or did I just wander all over the place? The question was, I think, when did I realize? I realized that things are totally hopeless when I was in Auschwitz. Until I, came to, Until I came to Auschwitz, I felt, you know, they'll realize the mistake and I'm going to leave. But once I got to Auschwitz, that was it, finished. There was, uh, there was no more Mr. Nice Guy. You know, that was it, that was the end of the line. Any other questions? Any other questions? I, a Croat, a Croat, French, and uh, in German. I just, I just 
came back from Germany. from Germany. I was in Germany in December, I and I spoke in Germany seven times. Uh, seven times. I was asked to speak once, and once they heard me speak, they'll say, we'll let you speak until you get it right. So I spoke seven, I spoke seven times, and uh, I was amazed, and I, I'm serious, I was amazed at the capacity of the brain, because I didn't speak German for 70 years, and suddenly I found myself speaking German. I only had problems with, I, I couldn't remember some of the words, but my sentence structure and everything uh, was perfect. I had no problem, I spoke to high schools and middle schools. It was interesting. It was an interesting experience. Any other question? Any other question? How did the If he whispers, you shouldn't whisper. I'm having problems. <laughs> oh, why did the, oh, why did the uh, uh, prisoners die from eating that food? Well, we lived on pretty well zero calories and suddenly we get these military rations. These military rations were developed uh, for people in fighting condition under the worst possible uh, you know, conditions. And uh, so you had Three military rations, military rations put together were roughly 2,800 calories. So you have a, roughly 1,000 calories per package. There were three packages, one for breakfast, one for lunch, and one for dinner. And they were prepared so that the number one prisoners could carry them in their pockets and number two, that it wouldn't be bulky food, you know. So it was concentrated, it was like uh, giving them a glass of oil, so to speak, you know. And we lived on zilch, and suddenly we, we got hit with a thousand calories. Uh, you know, it's uh, like uh, drinking a bottle of olive oil, you know. And, uh, and people developed a terrible diarrhea, and uh, there was no medication there whatsoever. You know, even if there would have been medication, can you imagine medication for, let's say, 30,000 people with diarrhea? You know, you're talking about truckloads. You're not talking about, uh, you know, have a, have a, a pill. And uh, people got dehydrated. You know, so it, to treat somebody with extreme diarrhea, you know, requires rehydration, requires uh, dry food, it requires all different types of things. You know, it's a, uh, do two minutes research, you'll know more than what I told you just now. Uh, but the consequences where that uh, people just died. But, you know, do I blame the American soldiers for giving no. us the food? No. They had absolutely nothing. They had the choice of giving us that or nothing. And if they would have given us nothing, we would have died anyway. If I wouldn't have had some food, I would have been dead within a day or two. Okay? So, what they, what they gave us was the only thing that they had. You know, the way there was all the food, all the, food, all the field work that was done was done by men, 
you know, the, the, in agriculture. And the men and the men had been pulled into the military. So nobody worked the field. And if there was any food there, then the military confiscated it. You know, so there was nothing there. Even when I came back home to Yugoslavia, there was very, very, very little food around. Very little. I was in a hospital uh, to have my feet operated on and uh, the nurses there, they were all Catholic nurses, which is normal in Europe, you know, that the nurses in the hospitals are nuns. And they were desperate trying to give me some food. They didn't have any, even in the hospital. So they had... Uh, Placed me in rooms. Uh, placed me in a room with two beds. I was in one bed, and they put farmers in the other bed. Farmers who had uh, hemorrhoid operations or some stomach operations, and were not permitted to eat any food. But they didn't tell the wives of the farmers. So the wives brought food for the farmer, and they took it and gave it to me. And that's the only way I got food. But uh, it was very, very hard. Any other questions? Any other questions? Were any of the SS officers who did not want to go to any of the SS officers who did not want to go to any of the SS officers? Uh, the question was, were any of the SS officers merciful? Very, 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 very few. The kind, first of all, they were, many of them were volunteers. They wanted to work in the concentration camp, so, you know, the idea of mercy wasn't there in the first place. Uh, the kindest SS man I ever faced was when I was in Auschwitz and I once walked very close to the wire, the electric wire, there was an assessment there and they said, you better move away or I'll have to shoot you. It was the nicest thing he could do. And uh, I moved away and he didn't shoot, shoot me. But beyond that, uh, the answer is no. There may have been somewhere else. I've heard stories, but uh, you know, if it's a very, very rare story that you hear, uh, it's, uh, it really didn't make any impact on the general picture. You know, one out of 10,000 SS men is nice, but it doesn't make much of a difference. Any other questions? We have a young lady there. Uh, after the war, I was in the hospital for about three weeks. I was there. I was there because I I was too weak to walk. I, I just uh, at what point my body gave out. <laughs> uh,
I'm not saying how long. Right, but he looks younger than he did last year. I, that's what I said before. <laughs> I think he looks better than last year. You're getting your, you, you, you press it to the top of the hill, you're actually getting younger. I, I have a girlfriend. Yeah, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> 
good your friends, my wife and I and uh, her husband. She always live in England. Yeah. And she and uh, we were very good friends. As a matter of fact, we played Carnasco the night when she suddenly said, I have to stop playing because I have to go to the hospital. Birth pain, and she gave birth to her first child. Uh, we were very, very good friends, and uh, her husband died, and my wife died. And, uh, uh, I visited people, and I got together with them. We sort of felt. I know it's so stupid, but there's no way I'm going to have a girl now. You know, I, I know that you're and I'm very, very pregnant. Uh, but I am not going to have a get to know somebody. Yeah. Don't don't worry get my, you know, this this makes it so simple. Yeah. We can we know each other and we can go trust each
this note. Time for lunch. <laughs> Time for lunch.